classroom drugs have a lot of data available in the last uh, decade. We have a lot of uh, uh, data available on these two models. And to summarize all that in, in 15 minutes would be uh, quite a challenging job. So what I try to do is I try to uh, speak about uh, generally what are the challenges today in the management of diabetes, discuss about briefly about the pathophysiology of hypoglycemia and how these uh, two classroom drugs act on uh, on this and then discuss about uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, glycemic efficacy, the rates of hypoglycemia, all these aspects of these two molecules and then discuss just briefly about how the combination of these is also, uh, also playing an important role. So if you look at uh, uh, the diabetes trends, we know that diabetes is increasing uh, worldwide and in our country also we are seeing that you know, particularly in the age group of 50 to 60, we have a significant, uh, we have a huge number of people with that in that age group. But you know, the, the prevalence is increasing right from the earlier age. And uh, what we see is that uh, if you look at uh, data from the entire study, which we see that uh, a large number of our patients are not under control. So more than two thirds of our patients are not reaching the goal that they need to be at. That is a HB1C target of less than seven. If you look at it, uh, then only uh, less than one third of our patients are at that. Goal. And we know that you know when they are uh, when they are at when they are not at goal, they are at very high risk of uh, having the various uh, problems associated with diabetes. That is the microvascular complications and the cardiovascular complications. And we also have good evidence from uh, studies like the UK PD study, which has shown that early aggressive management of these patients is going to prevent uh, all the complications. So, looking at that in that background, we see that. Uh, there is a significant uh, sort of uh, uh, problem in these patients and there is a significant residual risk in spite of all the medications that we are using and, and so we need to uh, you know, optimize the glycemic control and uh, use newer options, that, newer therapeutic options that we have today and uh, we, although the cost of these therapies are, are, important, are quite significant but if you look at uh, the cost of not treating diabetes properly, you know, properly it is much higher than the incremental cost of all the intensive treatments that we may use with the newer agents. So that they therefore, I think uh, there is uh, enough evidence today to say that uh, you know early aggressive management of diabetes is important and use all the options that we have. So if you look at the pathophysiology of diabetes, we have uh, significant uh, improvement in understanding of the pathophysiology with several newer, newer I mean, uh, several mechanisms being understood apart from the traditional insulin resistance and uh, beta cell dysfunction which, which remain the major uh, uh, major problems causing hyperglycemia. We have the contribution of other factors like uh, the uh, decrease in incretin effect and uh, alpha cell hyperactivity and maybe the brain uh, contribution towards uh, hyperglycemia and the uh, contribution of other factors like uh, like, the, uh, like the gut microbiota and all these have also uh, being understood in the past few years and we have seen that we have uh, now different therapeutic options which are, which are addressing all this and we uh, towards this, this is uh, very famously described as the as the ominous octet which uh, and we are looking at uh, how we could address these different uh, pathophysiological abnormalities. So if you look at uh, the, the traditional uh, medication that we have been using for several years, we have uh, uh, how and, and look at what they address. We see that the metformin addresses the uh, addresses uh, these uh, aspects which are mainly uh, governed by the insulin resistance and uh, while SUs have a limited role in terms of affecting the pancreatic, uh, improving the uh, sort of uh, augmenting the pancreatic insulin secretion. But if you look at the newer class of drugs, you see that the inhibitors have a significant uh, effect on uh, not only the insulin secretion but they also have an effect on the pancreatic pathway and uh, they suppress the alpha cell hyperactivity. They also have some uh, effects on the immune uh, system and, and, and also probably have some effects on the GI tract. And uh, if you look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, they are uh, uh, they are then covering the, the the other factor that is left over, that is the uh, the hyper I mean loss of uh, the uh, excessive uh, re, uh, reabsorption of glucose that is happening at the inhibitors. So what we see is that uh, these new cluster drugs are, are addressing many of the uh, mechanisms that are not covered by the by the available uh, earlier available drugs. So if we look at uh, now, if you look at uh, gliptins, um, 
quickly look, having a look uh, if you look at the gliptins we have been having this era of gliptins for i mean almost 19 years now uh, the gliptins were introduced about uh, almost about uh, uh, they came into research in 19 years back and i think we had the first gliptin in 2006 or 2007 i think 2006 we started off using gliptins so it's about 13 years since we've been using them and uh, if you look at uh, their mechanism action as we know that uh, they uh, are acting mainly through uh, enhancing the incretin pa pathway that is by uh, inhibiting the breakdown of dpp4 uh, uh, inhibiting the inhibiting the dpp4 effect and thereby inhibiting the breakdown of glp1 the endogenously produced glp1 and thereby they have uh, uh, they increase the glucose uh, they increase the insulin secretion in a glucose dependent fashion and uh, also have a uh, effect on suppressing the group 1 secretion so through these mechanisms they are uh, they are uh, improving the insulin secretion and also suppressing the glucon and suppressing the hepatic glucose output and as you can see on this uh, familiar figure of the ominous octet you can see that uh, they are uh, acting at at least six different sites so they are covering at least six of the eight defects and therefore they have a versatile effect in in managing patients with uh, type 2 diabetes now coming to the sglt2 inhibitors as we have seen sglt2 inhibitors are uh, inhibit the Uh, the reabsorption of glucose which is happening in the proximal tubule particularly by inhibiting the uh, type 2 or sgl uh, the sodium glucose transporter and uh, which is responsible for almost 90% of the glucose reabsorption that is happening in the proximal uh, tubule and uh, because of that you see that there is excessive glucose loss in the urine and that contributes to some calorie loss and that results in not only in glucose lowering uh, which has its uh, benefits in terms of decrease in glucotoxicity and, and reducing the microvascular complication but also they have uh, effects on because of the osmotic diuresis there is a uh, favorable effect on the blood pressure and a favorable effect on the weight so having looked at that let us see what is the clinical evidence available with the dpp4 inhibitors we have different classes of uh, different uh, molecules available yeah, today six six and if you look at their pharmaco they may differ slightly in terms of their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and the way they are excreted and handled in the body but uh, but essentially what we see is that if you look at the efficacy uh, almost all of them have uh, a similar efficacy they are they are uh, uh, bringing down the HbA1c to the tune of 0.5 to 0.8 percent and uh, they also have those additional benefits which are similar in most of them. So if you can look at the, this DPP4 inhibitors, they bring down the, uh, they uh, are very good for postprandial glucose control, uh, they have uh, some effect on the fasting glucose and they have a significant impact on the HbA1c, I mean moderately significant impact on the HbA1c reduction. And at the same time, they, they cause less glycemic variability and, and uh, they reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain and improve the quality of life. So these are the benefits that we see with the use of TPP4 inhibitors and they synergize very well with, the, with metformin in terms of uh, bringing down the HVLC. And uh, if you look at uh, data on uh, different classes of drugs, you find that uh, this is a real world data with the uh, Vildagliptin which is used in several Uh, thousands of patients and it has shown that in the real world scenario in Indian patients it brought down the HVLC to the tune of 1.44 percent. So that's quite impressive and uh, it has uh, it, it has an effect of reducing the variability which is studied by, which is looked at in CGM studies and this is a study which is looking at uh, renally impaired patients and they were there also it had a significant uh, favorable impact on the glucose variability. Now looking at it, CV safety of these drugs We know that uh, we have uh, uh, these different uh, CVOT trials of uh, DPP4 inhibitors, the TCOS trial, the Cetagliptine exam in Sevotini. All of them have shown that uh, these molecules are, are uh, safe from the cardiovascular aspect. And they, uh, however, the, the issue was in terms of heart failure, which was particularly with, uh, with the Sevotini trial, there was increase in heart failure. But with other molecules, there was no, uh, uh, no significant uh, effect on the heart failure seen with uh, either cetagliptine or with the uh, linagliptine and uh, today we have, uh, we, although we don't have a good uh, cardiovascular, a dedicated cardiovascular safety trial with uh, linagliptine, we have data from the other uh, uh, studies which have looked at real life studies of linagliptine which have shown that it also has a favorable CV profile and they also have a favorable effect on the, uh, on the renal profile in terms of reducing amphibolia but although they have not been shown to reduce the progression of renal disease. 
Now, they are using renal failure, as we all know, they are quite safe in renal failure. Uh, however, some of them need a dose adjustment like uh, CITAR and uh, SAXA and uh, we, uh, require and we can require dose reduction, but renal treatment does not require that. And uh, so, if you finally look at the perspectives that we have on these DV4 inhibitors, they are, uh, they are useful in a wide spectrum of patients, they are also useful in the elderly patients, they, are, uh, they have a good safety profile. They are weight neutral, they have low risk of hypoglycemia, and we have a large uh, I mean, uh, experience of more than 12 13 years on the, on the use of these drugs. The concerns are mainly in terms of, uh, you know, in, uh, in patients with uh, previous history of pancreatitis and the risk of arthralgias that has been uh, seen recently has been published, some way down that has been published, and then, and then uh, uh, in, increase in nasopharyngeal infections has, is, is, are the major uh, concerns that we have with the lipids. Now coming to the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, we know that they have these additional benef benefits in terms of uh, uh, reducing the blood pressure and, and, and improving the weight, causing weight loss and, uh, uh, and, and, and the metabolic switch they cause uh, brings about some benefit in terms of the cardiovascular benefits that we have seen in, in the, on the trials. I'll, just, I'll quickly summarize some of the data on, on these drugs. Uh, if you look at uh, their efficacy in terms of glycemic efficacy, we see that uh, uh, either as monotherapy as a, or as an add-on to metformin, they are very good, and as an add-on to other drugs also. And in this slide, you can see that uh, when they are added on to any of the other drugs, you find that they have a additional benefit of breaking down the HbA1c to the team of over 0.7 to 0.8%. And uh, they are superior to some of the existing drugs like the sulfonylureas in terms of uh, cause uh, bringing about a similar efficacy with low risk of hypoglycemia. And uh, what has been seen is that the effect has been durable. The effect on body weight is uh, shown in this, uh, in this slide where, uh, where, where whether it's added on to any of the drugs, we find that there is an additional uh, weight loss that is seen about 2 to 3 kgs of weight loss in with any of these class of drugs. And the reason is mainly because of loss of calories uh, in the, uh, with the glucose group, excretion that is happening. And, the, and the loss is mainly from the subcutaneous and visible fat. Then if you look at the blood pressure effect, you see that there is a, uh, uh, a, a, a effect, a, a modest effect on the blood pressure, particularly the systolic blood pressure, and even the small reductions that you're seeing in the blood pressure are, are favorable in terms of the cardiovascular risk. And the major, and, uh, again, the reason for this is because of the osmotic diabetic effects, and uh, this, is, this also leads to reduce you know, reduction in arterial stiffness and, and also some direct classical benefits. Now, if we look at the clinical outcomes with uh, in the Empire trial, the Empire trial was the first, uh, very first uh, cardiovascular outcome trial, which gave a very positive uh, result and, and sort of um, uh, started off the era the, the, of this cardiovascular benefit, which you've seen with the other glucose uh, also. So, if you look at the Empire trial, you see that there was a uh, significant benefit in the three-point maze and also in the reduction. Uh, in the cardiovascular deaths, reduction of significant death from any cause of came down significantly. And uh, we also uh, had data on this, uh, on the renal benefits that were seen from the, from the sub-analysis of the, I mean, post-hoc analysis of the MBARIC trial. And this slide summarizes all the uh, three cardiovascular outcome trials of the major uh, uh, SGF2 inhibitors that we know of the MBARIC trial, which showed the benefit in three point maze. Uh, Canvas program also showed the benefit in the three-point base and, and um, uh, declared to me which uh, showed the benefit in terms of the heart failure, uh, hospitalization from heart failure in the cardiovascular death, the composite of these two. And uh, then we have the credits trial which has shown the renal benefits and the different mechanisms that have been proposed for the renal benefit are this year. I think we heard about the credits trial uh, earlier in the day. And, uh, and this is the renal outcomes uh, which were favorable renal outcomes seen in the post hoc analysis of the empower rate trial. Now coming to the adverse events associated with, uh, with the SGMT2 inhibitors, the, we know that uh, they cause, uh, they increase the risk of uh, genital infections particularly, this is the, uh, uh, this is the figure which shows that genital infections are particularly increasing in female patients and uh, uh, the type of infections that we stratify by the severity of infections, mainly the mild infections. So these are generally treated with the protein uh, antibiotics that are used for treating uh, uh, treating UTI, and uh, they do not cause any significant concern. But the major concern is in terms of the 
the genital uh, fungal infections which are increased by uh, increased particularly again once again female, uh, females and, and, and the moderate and severe types of infections are increased. So this is the major concern that is there and uh, that requires uh, education of patients once again. And so if you look at uh, the final perspective that we have <laughs> on, the, on the SGL2 inhibitors, we see that uh, they have all the benefits in terms of uh, the cardiovascular risk factors and uh, the cardiovascular outcomes have been shown to be favorably influenced. And uh, how are the concerns maybe are in terms of uh, uh, the uh, risk of uh, bacterial urinary infections, fungal genital infections, increased risk of amputation therapy, some of the uh, medi uh, some of the medications which have not been very clearly understood. Uh, and uh, the caution that we should take whenever a person, a person is sick and has a risk of acute kidney injury. So in these situations, we need to be careful about uh, using these drugs and particularly also the very severe hyperglycemia. So I think that's about uh, these two classes of drugs. Let, let me just spend half a minute on, on a combination of these two drugs uh, because these two drugs uh, work through different mechanisms which are synergistic and they have uh, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, through their action cause an increase in the, in the group 1 levels and uh, PP2 inhibitors as we said have a favorable effect on uh, of reducing the group 1 levels and therefore they sort of synergize with each other and uh, they could uh, 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 produce a reduction in hyperglycemia with pleiotropic benefits. And uh, the guidelines also now speak about uh, the triage in patients uh, into whether they have uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or CKD or not, and then deciding upon the use of um, drugs like this, SGN2 inhibitors in these kind of category of patients, and then thinking of uh, any of the other drugs in the patients who do not have these, uh, these risk factors. So, uh, just a word about uh, the fixed dose combination also are available uh, of these two classes of drugs. Uh, the first one available is uh, the combination of MPA and Lima, which has shown a uh, greater glycemic benefit as compared to each of them separately and a reduction in uh, HVMC across the, across the spectrum of HVMC, uh, the starting HVMC, whether it's less than 8.5 or more than 8.5, you find that the benefit is seen across the board. And, uh, there's early achievement of glycemic goals and uh, there's a higher percentage of uh, higher probability of reaching the goal, glycemic goal with this uh, combination as compared to using them separately. And uh, one other factor that has been seen apart from all the benefits that you see in terms of uh, the weight and the blood pressure, uh, there's a numerically lower uh, incidence of genital infection when these two are used together. So the mechanism of that is not clearly understood. Uh, but this is what has been seen in the studies. So finally, I would conclude uh, with the message that early aggressive management of diabetes is very important. DPP-4 inhibitors and the SGT2 inhibitors have added new therapeutic options by which we can uh, achieve better control of our uh, better control in our patients. And uh, they have considerable safety from hypoglycemia and weight gain, and they are. Uh, they are, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors are best used early in the course of diabetes and they are safe with various comorbidities while the SGT2 inhibitors have, uh, can be used across the wide spectrum of the disease and a combination of these two classes has also have a synergistic. So with that I conclude and I'll be happy to take any questions.